that's my name, Julius. Some of you know me from the young management days, uh, just a few days ago, of course. Uh, it's been my privilege for the last 10 years to work with the IADC on the young management program and uh, in, the, in the recent past to join this program. Uh, what I would like to do is, uh, as we mentioned for the young management program, uh, to raise your eyes to the horizon. What's on the horizon? What's coming towards us? But equally, to give yourselves some elevation so you can not only see what's coming towards you, but you can see what's behind that. And that uh, idea is behind this session, which is to look at what is behind the drivers. Now, all the drivers are positive insofar as your industry interests are concerned. All of them should keep you in business till the end of time. And all of them are uh, somewhat at variance to what is happening in the global economy more generally. So it's like that discussion on who will survive nuclear war, who will survive the coming crisis, come what may, should be the dredging industry. Uh, but it's not, of course, that simple. So this session I'd like to use to explore what lies behind the drivers and then try and align some of our insights into that um, process to the objectives of this workshop, which is for you to consider four specific questions in my workshop group and, of course, a set of questions in Serge's workshop group which will connect your operational situation to the broader global context. So that's my plan. Um, but before I start, having seen all the music and knowing that this venue 20 years ago was for performance artists, is that right? Recording, Recording artists. And today it's for the International Association of Dredging Companies. Um, Tell me who will be using this venue in 20 years' time. Uh, none of us have a clue. Uh, it's a little bit like that. Our, our challenge today is a little bit like trying to consider this situation. Okay, what do I press? This? Yeah, so these are the drivers which Frank had identified. And I think we'd all agree these are the principal driving forces behind what is shaping your world and indeed will shape much of the global economy. Uh, in economic terms, we sometimes um, explain these as demand, uh, demand drivers. Uh, these are the requirements that have to be met, demand. Uh, when we look behind the drivers, what drives the drivers, we're looking at supply. So in economic terms, it's an issue of demand and supply. This is what's driving the agenda. Can we meet the requirements? Can we supply what that system needs to support your industry in handling this challenge? And that's much more complicated because then we get into the realm of politics, etc. We also get into the realm, and which I, I appreciate Frank for highlighting that in the last slide, uh, your capacity. And I was very impressed by that last slide. The business model of uh, dredging companies has evolved dramatically and significantly over the last couple of decades. So when we assess capacity to respond, we have to also bear in mind um, companies adapt they redesign their business models constantly, and they find a way to address the issues, perhaps in unique forms. So these are the big drivers. Uh, we're all uh, relatively familiar with them. I'm in interested in getting to the next point. So on the supply side, uh, and uh, you'll notice that supply and demand op operate in the same sphere. Um, demographic features. So 7 billion will become 9 billion or 10 billion, etc. Most of those people will be in coastal areas. Uh, two years ago, 
the stock of people in the world in urban areas crossed 50% of the total stock of people in the world for the first time in human history. This is exactly the area you occupy, urban spaces, coastal areas, and in, in the climate change context, context, vulnerable coastal areas. But the reason I highlight it here is because 90% of this increase will be in developing countries. The question then is, do these countries have the money to address the requirements of their demographic shift? And while there is a lot of money in the world, um, and while there are a number of devel developing countries which have the reserves and resources to address this, it's not equal everywhere. And if there's a misalignment between resources in the financial sense and the requirements in the demographic sense, and of course the infrastructure that flows from that, uh, we as a global system have to find a solution. That may not be a, uh, a responsibility for, for the dredging industry, but it's certainly a responsibility for, na for national uh, governments. Uh, technology and innovation, I need not say much about this. Um, supply side issue, it can change the landscape totally. But it also flows often from a policy context. Uh, so if the climate change policy context creates uh, binding obligations, uh, companies will invest and technologies will be found which comply with requirements. But it is a supply side issue which can also be created by, as I said, by uh, policy context. So the, the, the quote we often use here to dramatize this is uh, Henry Ford, um, when asked uh, about cars, said, if I listened to what people wanted, they would have said faster horses. Uh, he created the supply of cars, he created the cost effectiveness and efficiency of production, and he made, through the supply side process, a new technology available to a public which actually probably wanted faster horses. So this is a very supply side element of the equation. The nature of economic growth, trade and economic activity. As Frank highlighted, if you look at long-term trends, uh, these are pretty powerful because behind it all is the, is the demographic impulse. Um, bear in mind a couple of things. Trade grows faster than economic growth and has grown faster than economic growth since the 1940s. Trade on average grows at about 8% a year, economic growth 3% a year. Your business is related much more to trade, but also to economic growth, but trade principally. So here again, the nature of economic growth and how it is distributed uh, will determine whether the drivers work to support your industry or, in effect, can create problems. Uh, equity issues. It's a big issue in the global political debate. Not everyone is getting an equal share of the global pie. Um, if you look at this from an economics point of view, uh, major problems of equity can destroy uh, social cohesion and can create um, conditions of internal civil strife. So unless the equity issue is addressed somehow, somewhere by politicians, the growth model won't be sustainable. And if the growth model isn't sustainable, then your, your, your industry is vulnerable. So that's a political problem, which of course Frank um, highlighted. And raw materials uh, can be seen, of course, as a demand side issue, but in this case, a case, supply side issue. The reason I highlight it here is because you're only part of a group of companies that consume these raw materials. Uh, the bigger and more powerful part is the construction industry. Uh, if you are all pursuing the same sources of raw materials, and I'm thinking here of sand and aggregates, and if they are bigger than you are, and they have more money, and they're politically well connected, then your business will be vulnerable. 
So it's about security of supply as much as cost and availability. And this is not easy to read because obviously it varies uh, enormously around the world and across, uh, across the market. Okay, so you raise your eyes to the horizon and you gain a little elevation, but you also have to adopt a multiplicity of perspectives. So I use the double-headed eagle <laughs> as a metaphor. It doesn't exist as we know, well, not yet, um, but it comes from Central Europe. I mean, historically it originally came from Turkey, but it's been used principally in Central Europe, and it's about looking east and west at the same time. Central European states have always had to balance the politics of the East and West and incorporate the considerations and perspectives. But it equally applies to you as individuals looking one way and your companies having priorities in, perhaps in another direction. It equally applies for companies having their priorities but the business having a, 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 a fresh set of issues. It can be personal, it can be anything. You look inside yourself or you look beyond yourself. The idea here is when you consider in the workshop the issues that we want you to look at, adopt as many perspectives as you can. Uh, of course within the group you'll have engineers and accountants and scientists and, uh, and uh, lawyers and economists and so on. Draw on all that because it is through that process that the, that the, that the the, the uh, workshop process works the best. Okay, now time horizons. Um, because we're in such an unstable world, uh, we've tried to highlight the time horizon you should have in mind for this exercise. About five to ten years. The assumption here is that you're already locked into a business model which will run for the next few years you have some flexibility in looking at your strat strategic and business ambitions beyond that. And beyond 10 years, it's very difficult to read anything into the future. So we want to keep this exercise relevant to where you are today, with reference to where you could be in a few years' time, with reference to what you can do about it. Uh, so that's why I put it like that. Now, it is obviously not the same for each type of challenge. For instance, in finance, the time horizons are much shorter. We can take the example of the dollar. Will the dollar rise in value? Will interest rates on the dollar rise or fall? Uh, this is something in the immediate future which everyone has to worry about because contract values, by and large, are de determined or denominated in, in dollars. If these change, then the profitability of a project can, can fundamentally shift. So the, the, the time horizon is not the same for everything, but I just highlighted it for, this, for, the point, for the purpose of reference. Now, one of the things Frank highlighted was uh, political uncertainty in today's world. We talked about Erdogan, of Putin, of Trump, of Brexit, of Duterte, of X, Y, Z. Um, it used to be that we could look at things strategically. In other words, we could look five to ten years into the future. With this disruption in the political framework, uh, we're looking at things tactically. How do we manage? How do we cope? How do we survive? So the tactical view is often, doesn't often suit your industry, which requires long-term investment commitments. Uh, and that is a, an issue you have to incorporate into your, anal your analysis. How strategic can you be or how tactical do you have to be? And maybe there's an issue there of being diversified across different sectors as a means of balancing the risks um, involved. Okay, so please don't look too far into the future, though of course you have to have a framework that can help you. And in, in climate change, this can be this can be um, challenging. Okay, so while you brainstorm, uh, please don't lose control of the storm. Uh, what could possibly go wrong? Has anyone ever seen this before? Yeah. yeah? So what the Americans wanted to do in Afghanistan is find a 
a, a solution to the problem. So they brainstormed and identified all these interconnected issues. And they said, if we can do all of that, we'll have peace. So how's it going? Excessive complexity is, is of no use at all. Uh, brainstorming has to be for a purpose. It has to be selective and it almost has to be determinative in the sense you have to know what you want. This type of exercise is a total waste of time. It provides a little bit of satisfaction for the people who do it, but it doesn't give you an operational plan. Now, interestingly, this is the American way of looking at dealing with Afghanistan. If you compare it, and of course this is not the purpose of this exercise, with the way the Soviets dealt with Afghanistan, the Soviet approach was much, more, much, more sim much simpler and much more effective. Uh, it broke down for other reasons, but it was a much simpler approach because they didn't fuss about the sensitivity. Okay, you can tri triangulate this another way. Because when this was shown to the Afghan leadership, the president said, why not leave it to us to decide our own future? Uh, we don't need an American worldview and an American plan. We just know what we can do to deal with our own issues. Perspectives, they are so important and so um, uniquely uh, situation specific. Okay, now if you uh, consider some of the scenarios, so finance. Um, Frank mentioned global trade is uh, one of the principal drivers, absolutely. But global trade creates three types of surpluses, oil and raw materials, uh, agricultural commodities, and trade, merchandise surpluses. Okay? Think of this in terms of the countries where your contracts are operating. Are they earning an income from oil? Are they earning an income from raw materials? Or are they earning an income from merchandise surpluses? If yes, 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 then those countries will be able to fund and underwrite project costs. If no, 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 then not. Now, Frank had mentioned South Asia and Southeast Asia as the areas, key areas where the demographic shift is going to be enormous. Southeast Asia, countries like Indonesia and Malaysia have oil. South Asia, countries like India and Pakistan and Bangladesh do not. Uh, so the project financing in one situation is much, has much greater potential than in another. Having said this, um, this morning's news, the World Bank has alerted the world to the possibility of an economic recession caused by Donald Trump's trade wars. And what the World Bank has said is if trade wars escalate, this will wipe 9% off global economic growth, 9%, which is the same as the figure in 2008. And whatever trade remains will be by value, the volume is more complicated. And therefore, the countries that feed off trade, so we're talking about countries like China, will find they're losing money, unable to afford projects. And countries that feed off trade in commodities will face the same problem. But it, of course, the pattern will, will vary. So what the World Bank has told us this morning is, yes, tra trade is a massive driver for growth, but trade isn't equal everywhere. If, it, if we have a recession, it'll hit these three categories particularly hard. If global demand drops, so the effect of a recession is global demand will fall, then what will happen to oil prices? They will also fall as a consequence. We have massive capacity to produce oil. We'll have overcapacity and the price of oil will fall, then the oil-dependent economies, of which there are several in the world, will be unable to finance their projects. So we have to keep an eye on all these considerations. Trade, yes, is a driver. The nature of trade and the direction it takes and the prices of things that are traded will determine whether your projects can be financed or not. Um, the climate change agenda of course, we don't know how quickly this will kick in. But our sense politically, and I'm sure Sergei will, 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 will present this much more comprehensively, 
is that if you move to change regulations as a government, move quickly. If, you, if you're slow, you're the last mover. If you're the first mover, you can shape the investment environment to suit your own businesses. So what we expect to see is the European Union, particularly, but equally and also countries like China, the United States, we can't make out what on earth is going to happen, could move very, very quickly, much more quickly than anyone realizes, simply to capture market share for their domestic companies, which will then be projected globally. And this is a, a tactic governments use, the political side of the obligations. So that too has to be borne in mind. Economic growth strategies. Um, when Frank was presenting, he showed how a lot of countries are switching from global trade to domestically driven growth models. This also alters the pattern of demand in your industry, business. And, but how it will alter it, I don't know. Now, we talked about the, the one belt, one road policy. And literally in the last couple of days, Malaysia has cancelled the high-speed railway network which they were building towards, uh, which were committed to build towards Singapore. So the integration of the, that peninsula will now wait. Burma is thinking of cancelling the Chinese project which connects the um, Indian Ocean, the Bay of Bengal to China, Chongqing, the markets of interior China. While this is enormous, um, and it is unstable, but it could be significant. Because what that means, Burma's growth model will now have to change to be less dependent on extracting and, and, and sending Chinese products through the country to something else. But what is that something else? We don't know. Uh, and what do they want? Of course, we're then, we don't yet know. Uh, but this has to be monitored. Uh, what is the growth strategy of the country you're working in? And how does it all fit together with the global scheme of things? And if a growth strategy, and consider Iran here for a moment, Iran, based on the agreement to constrain their nuclear program, uh, solicited and obtained huge amounts of investment into their domestic recovery strategy. Trump comes along and says, I'm not going to comply. All those investors are now pulling money out of Iran because of the uncertainty of the future. So Iran's growth model is now in doubt. We don't know what, it's going to, what shape it'll take. Now, Iran is a huge country and a potential market for, of course, your, your, um, your business. Uh, but that's just an example of how unstable things are at the moment. Uh, the final slide on the final point on this slide I've talked about uh, raw material constraints. As with regulation, so with protective measures by governments, they move much more quickly than you realize. The problem with raw materials, particularly aggregates, is there is no global norm by which countries should do this or could do this. So each country will do it its own way. And if each country does it its own way, the market for raw materials fragments. The compliance requirements, the regulatory standards are separate for each jurisdiction. <coughs> this means raw materials will be less abundantly available, more expensive, and the, avail the, the risk of access will be much, much greater. For what you do, this is huge. Uh, and we're expecting this to kick in quite soon. So as I was telling my colleagues um, earlier, uh, I've just come from a conference in Barcelona with uh, tax lawyers. So you'd think, uh, what on earth do tax lawyers know about this? First thing they said, sand is running out. And what they're seeing reflected in contracts, because remember these lawyers write lots of contracts, is the risk of the uncertainty of this raw material in a huge number of activities is compromising the viability of projects. And they, as tax advisors, look at this amongst many other issues. I was actually quite struck by how, uh, how dramatically they, they, they see the transition kick in. OK, uh, spectrum of process complexity. Yeah, don't look <laughs> too far into the future. 
Um, for the exercises you do, you need to sort of, in your mind's eye, frame something which, which is reasonably easy or, or you, can get a, you can sort of determine the parameters of what you're doing. Once it spreads out into the future, you're lost. Now, as I say, this is an inherent contradiction. You, as an industry, need long-term clarity. But the long-term today is three days. The long-term horizons in Trump's world is probably 10 minutes. But that won't work for your business. So can you create in local jurisdictions that degree of certainty? And that's a, that's a political issue, that, which is hard for anyone to um, hard for anyone to organize. Okay, uh, team decision making. This is a, a, a slide I stole from somewhere, I don't know what it was. Um, but the idea being, uh, if you have consensus, and consensus is unanimous consent, you get a straight, easy, quick plop. The decision kicks in, everyone agrees. But in decision making, <coughs> In the science of decision-making, there's something called an optimis optimism bias. You must have come across this. An optimism bias. We all tend to build our decision decisions on assumptions which, if we want them to be true, will bias the decision towards an optimistic outcome. And we'll all say yes. What you need in a situation of that sort is naysayers, people who will be a nuisance, who will question the, the, the assumptions, who will challenge. Optimism bias is probably the single biggest uh, decision-making error of governments, of companies, of, of families, of individuals, uh, and is hard to rectify. So the process of building a decision, a consensus, has to incorporate um, nuisance. Um, are you familiar with the um, Catholic uh, pro Church's process of uh, beatification? How you create a saint? They appoint a devil's advocate. Yeah. They appoint a devil's advocate. Someone who will advocate for the devil to undermine the case to make someone a saint. It's that sort of consideration that one has to build into the process. It's easy to go along with the flow. It's very difficult to stop and say, are we sure about the assumptions? Okay. So, uh, again, I reference uh, the presentations made earlier. When you look into the future, will business as usual work with, with minor adjustments, uh, adaptations? Our senses, which is why we have this program, uh, no, we have to rethink a lot of stuff. Our confidence flows from the fact that, as the previous presentation highlighted, the industry has adapted enormously over the past few years to deal with these challenges. That would have to continue, but what form will it take has to be one of the considerations. And what direction will it move in also has to be a consideration. So it's in what way and why. Um, the final point on this slide is about companies working alone. This is a vast, complex, interconnected, policy-related, finance-related, um, drivers-driven um, uh, context. Uh, industries working alone trying to plow a lonely furrow, trying to find solutions, probably not as effective as working across the whole sector. So one of the, one reason why we have this networking event is to try and understand the logic of cooperation. Now, I'm not saying cooperation with a view to eliminating competition. It's with a view to supporting competition. So your rival companies, but if you work to, if you absorb a certain amount of common understandings about common issues, uh, that level of competitiveness actually improves. So the example we used last time uh, 
with the Tour de France. Uh, the peloton consists of eight rival cycling uh, companies, uh, teams. Unless they work together, yeah, unless they work together, they can't maintain a high average speed. And they can't bring the leadership group back into the peloton. In other words, what cooperation delivers is higher average speed. But it doesn't mean, the co uh, it doesn't mean competition disappears. The eight teams are still in competition to win the Tour de France. So the Tour de France is a very good parallel to use. Of course, we have to keep an eye on the law. Competition policy is important, so competitive conditions have to be retained. We don't want OPEC-style uh, um, collusion. We want uh, Tour de France-style cooperation and competition. And bearing in this in mind, then the question is about roles. Can an individual company do this? Can a single rider win the Tour, of Fra Tour de France without the support of his team? Can that rider be delivered to the front of the pack without the support of the peloton? No. So it is essential to consider how the group, as a group, could coordinate, cooperate, and in what form uh, to deliver a higher, uh, to cope with the future and to deliver a higher quality project. And the uh, additional consideration in that sense also has to take into account the global context of deep, profound, um, worldwide uncertainty. So I'll leave it there, if I may, and uh, I think we have uh, a lunch break coming up. Um, did I run over time badly? Or? No. I'm okay. Okay. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you.